ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय श्रीमद् भागवतम Canto 1, Chapter 4, Text 32, Translation and Commentary by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Tasyaivam kilamatmanam manyamanasya kidyataha krishnasya narado bhyagad ashramam pragudaharitam Translation. As mentioned before, Narada reached the cottage of Krishna Dvaipayana Vyasa on the banks of the Sarasvati, just as Vyasadev was regretting his defects. Purport. The vacuum felt by Vyasadev was not due to his lack of knowledge. Bhagavad Dharma is purely devotional service of the Lord to which the monist has no access. The monist is not counted among the Paramahamsas, the most perfect of the renounced order of life. Srimad Bhagavatam is full of narrations of the transcendental activities of the personality of Godhead. Although Vyasadeva was an empowered divinity, he still felt dissatisfaction because in none of his works were the transcendental activities of the Lord properly explained. The inspiration was infused by Sri Krishna directly in the heart of Vyasadeva, and thus he felt the vacuum as explained above. It is definitely expressed here with that without the transcendental loving service of the Lord, everything is void, but in the transcendental service of the Lord, everything is tangible, without any separate attempt at fruitive work or empiric philosophical speculation. In chapters 4 and 5 of the first canto is described Vyasadeva's dissatisfaction after compiling all the Vedic literatures, which might seem quite unusual, quite strange. He's known as Vedavyas, and he did what he was supposed to do, which was to divide the Vedas, therefore he's called Vyas, who divides, and through, directly and through his disciples, he, uh, not only divided but organized and all the Puranas except the Bhagavad Purana got edited and presented given in written form apart from that he gave the Mahabharata and Vedanta Sutras he's made an <clears throat> incalculable incalculable contribution to human society. But at this, having done all that, which is not humanly possible for any normal being, he still felt dissatisfaction, which may seem very strange. Why, why should he feel dissatisfied? Um, this, these two chapters they give us understanding of another seemingly very strange statement in the very beginning of Bhagavatam, uh, <clears throat> in the second verse, Dharma Kaitava Projita Atra. Herein, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, cheating religion is completely rejected. Well, the whole concept of there being cheating religion is very strange. Seems to be. There's dharma and there is adharma. Uh, 
if something is dharma, it should be good. If it's adharma, it's bad. But then how can you say cheating religion? It's, it doesn't seem right to say so. If you say uh, a bad good person. It's a bit difficult to work out. How can you be bad and good at the same time? Of course, it is possible. You can have bad traits and good traits, or you can be perceived as bad by someone or good by someone else. So in that way it's possible. But the Srimad Bhagavatam, or, or the Vedas, are supposed to be giving knowledge. Well, they, do, they do give knowledge. Not that it's supposed to be, but they actually do. So, uh, what's, what's all this about cheating? Cheating religion. In Bhagavatam, in the Vedas itself, it describes that there is paravidya and aparavidya. And most of the Vedas fall within aparavidya. Aparavidya means non-transcendental knowledge, as Krishna himself speaks in the Bhagavad Gita. Trividya vishaya veda. The Vedas mostly deal with subjects within the three modes of nature. But there is Paravidya also, even before Vyasadeva, he compiled the Paravidya, means the knowledge is particularly of the Upanishads, transcendental knowledge, but he's still dissatisfied. So these uh, mysteries are to be understood before we even enter into the Bhagavata. I was just... Let me see, was it yesterday? No, two days ago. I, I was in... No, yeah, two days ago I was in... I'd been in uh, Himachal Pradesh for about a month. And uh, one gentleman I discussed with there told us how they had a regular function every year of reciting the Puranas reading out the Sanskrit of the Puranas. <clears throat> now, in the estimation of the people who engage, that means one every year, presumably the Mahapuranas. No. Uh, generally when we say the Puranas, we mean the Mahapuranas. Eighteen Mahapuranas. So, um, it seemed that in the estimation of this man that, well, they're all Shastra, so they're all the same. The Shastra itself states that it's not so. Six of the Mahapuranas are meant for persons in the, in the mode of ignorance, six for the persons in the mode of passion, six for persons in the mode of goodness, and among them all, the Srimad Bhagavatam, stands out, is outstanding. In the Bhagavatam itself it's stated that all, all the other Puranas look good as, as until the Srimad Bhagavatam comes. So how is it that Vyasadeva, who sh should have known all these things, it seems, he had come to the point of compiling all the Vedic literature and still being dissatisfied. <clears throat> How can that be when he's an avatar of Narayana, sometimes described as an Ave avatar? Please turn off your cell phone. Uh, now this may cause, the, the Gorya Vaishnava explanation of this may cause some anger in other quarters. How can you say Vyasadeva is bewildered? But we are the Gorya Vaishnava explanation allows for the Supreme Lord Himself to be as if bewildered for the sake of Leela. He may seem to be like that. Uh, now in Srila Prabhupada's purports in these 
fourth chapter and fifth chapter, there's some very uh, important statements, clarifying statements. Um, just in the previous purport, he stated that he, Vyasadev, appeared to have lost the clue for the purification of living entities. In other words, all the Vedic literatures are meant for the purification of the living beings. We're in the material world because we're in impure consciousness. Vedas are supposed to give us pure knowledge by which we can, and then we become purified. But the idea is that different people are on different levels, so give them knowledge that they can relate to at their particular level, even uh, people who are inclined to eat meat, there's allowance for them to become purified of that within the Vedas, within the Vedic knowledge. So the idea is to purify them, but what, what's the point of it all? The point is to bring everyone to the ultimate level of purification in pure devotional service to Krishna. But then if you compile so many things with so many processes, it appears that Vyasadeva had lost the clue. I, well, what's the point of it? That may happen to us in the course of our devotional service. We might think, well, why am I doing this? It may, it may strike. Why am I doing this? There's so many other things I could do. I could be, uh, I could be uh, an astronaut or a film director in Hollywood or I could be a Navy SEAL in the U.S. military. So many things I could be doing. I could be just a normal person in India, which means I wouldn't have to get up at four o'clock in the morning. I could get up at, what time do people get up here? Usually about 6.30, 6.30 to 7. And they do a quick brush, quick shower. Still, they still do shower. They didn't lose that one yet. And then rush off to work. But you don't have to get up. Before. You might think like that. Why am I doing this? Then we have to remind ourselves. Oh, for Krishna. Actually, it's for my own ultimate benefit. So we make the, we, there's, the mind is such that we may lose the clue of why we're doing it. Which is why we're supposed to have regular discussions on Bhagavatam to discuss all these points, to remind us why we're doing what we're doing. Otherwise, we may lose the clue. This is, uh, everything is meant for purification. Uh, what is that verse in the Gita? Kayena manasabhudya indriyayar kevalamapi yoginam karma kurvanti. What's the next word? Atma Shuddhaya. I'm just missing one word. What's the one word I'm missing? You got that? Kayena Manasa Buddha. Kevalaya Indira Pi. Yoginam Karma Kurvanti. Atma Shuddhaya. But there's just one word I'm missing in the fourth foot. Fourth pada. Anyway. Anyway, the point is that the yogis are abandoning attachment, yeah. They, everything they do with their mind, body and words is for the sake of purification. Did you find that? Kevalai Rindirayapi Yoginam Karma Korvanti Sangam Tyatvatma Shuddhaya That's it, yeah giving up attachment to this material world, they do everything for the sake of purification. Mm. 
So what was the point that Vyasadeva had appeared to have lost? That's also discussed in this purport. He did not specifically point out devotional service of the Lord Bhagavad Dharma. Didn't specifically point it out. He pointed out, yeah, definitely in other Shastras apart from Bhagavad Purana we'll find recommendations for performing devotional service to Vishnu. But there's also service to various demigods, there's karma, jnana, yoga, and then different uh, Vedic philosophers have given their understanding of what the Vedas are all about. Some say it's dharma. You should just do dharma. Atato dharma jignyasa. We should find out what is dharma and follow that. What's the ultimate goal? They don't have any ultimate goal. They think you just go up to heaven and you come back again and you go up again and you, that's it. Come and go. Gata gatam kama kama labhante. Krishna doesn't give much credence to this process. And others say yoga, do yoga. Yoga, chitta vritti nirodha. And you should stop the oscillations of the mind. So there are so many people saying so many things. There are so many different things in different shastras. And Vyasadev, in between, he put some points in some shastras, in Padma Purana, in Brahma Vaivarta Purana, in different Puranas, there are different statements recommending to devotional service to the Supreme Lord, but he doesn't delineate that as being the ultimate goal, which leads people to think that, well, you just choose whatever you want and go with it, and whatever's best for you. As if there's no specific atma dharma or activity of the soul. Uh, then another problem that Narada pointed out to Vyasadeva is that the transcendental activities of the Lord were not properly explained. Krishna came to this world to show his pastimes and Vyasadeva was supposed to point that out but he got lost it seems along the way. Because if Krishna's pastimes are described, at least in summary, as they are in the 10th canto of Bhagavatam, that's just a summary of Krishna's pastimes. But it takes, the 10th canto is much bigger than the other ones. So if those pastimes are given, it should be clear that Krishna is the Supreme. Krishna is the goal of the Vedas. Krishna is Supreme. One reason we can understand is because of his pastimes. There are no pastimes. That, even Krishna is the, uh, the, the best of the forms of the Supreme Lord. Other avatars are described in Bhagavatam. Rama, Nishinga, Varaha, Kurma. So many are described, but Krishna's pastimes, there are many, many, many pastimes. Just like <coughs> here in Gujarat is the place of Vamanadev, Brigu Kutch. So Vamanadev, he's known specifically for that pastime. But Krishna has so many pastimes. Nrsinga Dev is known specifically for the pastime of killing Hiranyakashipu. But Krishna has so many pastimes. And they're very sweet. And especially his pastimes with the young cowherd girls of Vrindavan. So in quantity, Krishna's pastime. He has so many wonderful pastimes. And the sweetness of them. There's no comparison with Krishna's Vrindavan pastimes. Especially his pastimes with the gopis. Either the elderly gopis, or even more intense, the young girls, the young gopis. But Vyasadeva 
he had not properly explained all this. And he did not, from another purport, Prabhupada writes, he did not broadcast the sublime and spotless glories of the Lord. Bhavatanudita prayam yasho bhagavato malam which might lead people to think if they hear about Krishna's pastimes that there's some problem. They may criticize. Why is Krishna doing this? Why is Krishna doing that? He seems to be immoral. But ultimately in the Bhagavatam Vyasa they've explained all these things. Without explaining all these things, then by Krishna coming to this world and having such pastimes, it may actually drive people further away from him. They may think, oh, what kind of God is that? He's having immoral activities. Or he's just a cowherd boy. What kind of God? We don't want God as a cowherd boy. He should, he should be a big king. So, uh, without broadcasting the sublime and spotless glories of the Lord, Vyasadeva may have not, he may have done a disservice not only by omission, not just by leaving it out, uh, but it, it may be, the, it, it, by leaving it out, he may not have just forgotten to do it, or just, but it may leave a gap in which people, they can only, whatever they know about Krishna, they can only explain it in terms of their mundane understanding and they'll come to criticize Krishna and be offensive. So Krishna's pastime should be described and the transcendental nature of his pastime should be described. Otherwise, the statement in Bhagavad Gita, which is given here in Gujarati, but even if you could read Gujarati, you wouldn't be able to see it because Jainitananda Prabhu, no fault of his, is that's Janma Karma Chame Devyam, this verse. Isn't it? Yeah, Bhagavad Gita Ma Ityadi. I can't read it very clearly. So that statement is there. Uh, Janma karma chame devyam evang yo veti tatvataha tyaktva dehang punar janma naiti maam eti surjuna. One who understands the transcendental nature of my pastimes is not upon quitting this body take birth again in this world, but takes, attains me, O Arjuna. So if it's not described, it's not explained how, first of all, what the activities are and how they're transcendental, then what's the point of Krishna speaking it? It, it becomes a, uh, a moot topic, which means it has no relevance. It becomes irrelevant to say it. So it's required. First, how uh, extensive are Krishna's pastimes and how pure they are. Nowadays, uh, there's some imitation by there's Sai Katha giving people give lectures on Sai Baba's pastime. There was some TV serial about Sai Baba, his pastimes, so-called pastimes, and Swami Narayana here in Gujarat. In in you all came from Bengal. In Bengal, no one heard of Swami Narayana. Practically, if you just go over the border to Rajasthan one way or to uh, Maharashtra another way or to Madhya Pradesh. These are the three states which border Gujarat. No one ever heard of this Swami Narayan. But they also made some pastimes of his. But however much you try to embellish it, but there's no comparison to Krishna. You can't do it. You, however m much magic someone does, however extraordinary someone may be, at most they can be a vibhuti of Krishna, an, a, 
a little show of his opulence, as described in the tenth chapter of Gita. Yad yad vibhuti matsamtam shrimad urjita mevavat tattadeva vargatchatram mama tejang sasambhavam. They can, however great someone may be in this world, they, it's only a slight representative of the power of Krishna. Just like recently, uh, the boxer Muhammad Ali passed away. Some of you are doing martial arts, you might want to, might have wanted to fight with him, but I wouldn't recommend it, however good you are. Because as he used to say in his youth, I happen to remember, I am the greatest, he used to say, I am the greatest. Then he converted to Islam. And he retracted that statement. He had the good sense to understand, I am not the greatest. So he is a prominent person in the world, or was until recently. He was one of the best boxers, and not only as a boxer, as his personality, he seemed to be a very good person, and he refused to fight against the Viet Cong, because he thought, what? he went to prison and lost his boxing championship. He was a principal person. He said, well, I'm not going to fight. I don't have any... I don't have any argument with them. They never did anything bad to me. So he's, I'm just giving this as a, he's, he's a great person of the world. But even if you wanted to write his biography and embellish it as much as you can, it, would, it, it won't come anywhere near the pastimes of Krishna. And no one can be like Krishna. And that's the whole point of the Vedas. Vedaishya sarva eraham eva vedyaha. No one in the past, present or future can be, is like or will be like Krishna. He's unique. And the whole point of the Vedas, Vaidaishya sarva eraham eva vedyaha, is to point to Krishna. But Vyasadeva had forgotten that. Now isn't that extraordinary? The whole point which is why he sat down at his ashram at Samya Prash and wrote all this, so many, big, big job. And then the whole point of it, he'd forgotten. Amazing. How is it possible? Well, it, it shows also how even if one may be very learned in the Vedas, but if you miss the point, a miss is as good as a mile. There's a saying in English. Do you know where that saying comes from? Can you imagine where that saying comes from? A miss is as good as a mile. Just like in archery. Do any of you do archery? Training as kshatriyas? Okay, so there's the target, right? Whoops. If you miss it by one centimeter or you miss it by one mile, it's the same. It's a miss. Of course, you get laughed at more if you miss it by a mile. But if you miss it by, say, your score is zero. So, similarly, if you miss the point of Krishna, you may be a, you may be, you see, you can walk up to the archery and hold your bow in a very sophisticated manner, put the, put the arrow on the bow, get it at the right angle, and do all the motions as if you're really an expert, but then if you miss, what's the point? Or you may be completely useless, and you don't even, you put the bow, you put the arrow back to front, uh, completely unknowledge, but it's the same point. If you miss, you miss. So you may be a very great learned scholar in the Vedas, but if you don't get the point of Krishna, then, as the Bhagavatam states, it's not stated anywhere else, 
But it's stated in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Dharma Svanushtita, Pungsang Vishvaksena Katha Suya, Not Padya Dyadi Ratim Shrama Evehi Kevalam. Whatever you may do, you may do so many things recommended in the Vedas. Go to holy places, perform austerities, study the Shastra, so many things. But if you don't get a taste for hearing about Krishna, it's all activity. That's all you can say. Shram, it's hard work. But no tangible result. Something like a, uh, a mouse on a treadmill. Treadmill, treadmill. Now at least, that's quite popular nowadays. Treadmills. Do you know what that is, a treadmill? It's, it, you walk or you run on it, and it goes round and round. They have these exercise machines. You don't go anywhere. They use it for exercise. And you can be running, 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 but you don't go anywhere. So you get the benefit of exercise, but you don't, there's no tangible result. You don't, you don't go from A to B, or from A to anywhere. Wherever you are, you just stay there. That's all. So in the same way, one can study all the Vedic literature, but if you don't get the point, then a miss is as good as a mile. Srila Prabhupada sometimes gave the example, it's probably a Bengali saying, that someone had said that after reading the whole Ramayana, there's just one point I couldn't understand. That Sita is the husband of who? It's, it's a symptom of having probably less than zero understanding. Because how can Sita be the husband of anyone? There are no sex change operations in those days. She's female. There's no question of Sita, the consort of Rama, being anything but the wife of Rama. So it's, a, it's a absurd. And Narada is pointing out, it's absurd. You missed the whole point. Yeah? Narad goes on to say that for all your exalted delineation of the Vedas, those words which do not describe the glories of the Lord are considered by saintly persons to be like a place of pilgrimage for crows via some tirta. Some may say, we're going on tirta yatra. Where? To a place of pilgrimage for crows, the garbage heap. That's a, it's a very strong denunciation, apparently, to say that all the Vedas is like a garbage heap for crows. Actually, it's not. The Vedas are worshipable, but they should be understood through the actual point. If we understand that it's all aimed at Krishna, then we get the point. Otherwise, it's not that the Vedas are like a place of pilgrimage to crow, for crows, but our, our understanding, our consciousness, remains within the modes of material nature which is contaminated. Uh, it's not Bhagavato Amalam, it's not the spotless glories of the Lord. And for all this, uh, for all his del delineation of various <coughs> subjects, the first point of spiritual understanding in most, he didn't teach that throughout most of the Vedas, didn't directly teach it. So, as stated in the second verse of the fifth chapter, Sharira Atma Manasa. It's, it's in the bodily concept of life. He identified the body and the mind as objects of self realization. Or the, so, it's really uh, without the knowledge of Bhagavatam. It becomes, yeah, the decoration of a dead body, as Srila Prabhupada 
in another purport, points that out. He paraphrases the verse from Hari Bhakti Sudhodaya, I believe it is, that uh, Bhagavad Bhakti Hinasya Jati Shastra Japas Japa Apranas Yaiva Dehasya Mandanam Loka Ranjanam Without Bhagavad Bhakti devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One may appear to be very pious. Uh, Bhagavad Bhakti. One may be born in a high family which is supposed to be a sign of piety from previous life. It is a sign of piety from previous life. One may be very learned in Shastra one may be very expert in chanting various mantras. One may be very austere, but it's all like the decoration of a dead body, which may be very pleasing to foolish people, but it's absurd at best. It's absurd and it's uh, grotesque. You know the word for grotesque? What is it? Ashoba, I guess you could say. There's no proper translation. I doubt if there's any proper translation. Kuchit is a Sanskrit word. Ugly. So, Srila Prabhupada writes this in one of these purports in the chapter. The literatures in relation with the gross body and subtle mind are full of matter described in decorative language, full of mundane similes and metaphorical arrangements, is considered decoration of a dead body. So we find that, that some people are very much benedicted by Saraswati, the external manifestation of Saraswati, to present things in such language that it seems very charming in uh, in Sanskrit the, the best poet is supposed to be Kalida it may seem very uh, appealing or in, in English there is Shakespeare and in various languages there are various writers in Bengali there's Rabindranath Thakur and if you hear it it sounds very nice but it's all, it's very decorative language. But it's all useless. Like the decoration on a dead body, because it all misses the point. Now, Srila Prabhupada writes in this purport, which we just read, uh, the inspiration was infused by Krishna directly in the heart of Vyasati. So Vyasa is supposed to be an, an inspired. So he was, ultimately he was inspired to to um, compile the Bhagavatam. But before that, he was inspired. Everyone's inspired by Krishna. <laughs> Either in a good way or a bad way. Even if we find the worst people in the world, they're also indirectly getting inspiration from Krishna. Hmm. No one has any personal strength. It all comes from Krishna. But still we have to distinguish between that which is pure and spiritual and that which is not. Simply to be powerful is not enough in itself. Just like I gave the example of this Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay. He got strength from Krishna to punch people out. To, to land them on their back. But that's not very laudable. Of course, it could have its usage, apart from the spot which netted him millions of dollars. But uh, without knowledge of Krishna, just like we praise Bhim for his strength. I think Muhammad Ali in front of Bhim, he wouldn't have had a chance. I don't think Bhim would have even fought with him. He's just not on the same level. But uh, we praise Bhimas 
strength. And he's also, some may appear to be pretty gross with all this drinking of dushash and his blood and his kichaka. He, he bammed, he, he made his, he squelched his body so it just became like one, one mass with no arms or legs or head. So Bhima appears to be pretty gross, but we praise him because it's all done in the service of Krishna. So Bhagavad Bhakti Heen, without Bhakti to Krishna, even very good qualities, they are not good at all. And even some apparently bad quality, if in the service of Krishna, it becomes not only purified, but worshipable. Up to the present day, we hear about bhimas, squashing or crushing kichaka, for instance. Now, um, again, quoting from various purports of Srila Prabhupada here, he, Vyasadev, repeatedly described the four principles, dharma, artha, kama, and moksha, dharmadeyas anukirtitaha, encouraging enjoyment in the name of religion. So, of course, you may say, well, that's what Vyasa is supposed to do. He's supposed to encourage people to follow dharma. You'll get some material benefit. All right, he's supposed to do that, but at, at least you should make it clear that you can do that if you like. That's in pursuing material enjoyment by the Vedic path is certainly much better than doing it without following the Vedic path. But it's not the ultimate goal. Vyasadeva had failed to point this out. Srila Prabhupada points out in one of the purports, the expert physician does not make any compromise with the patient by, by allowing him to take partially what, what he should not at all take. So this is uh, Narada's himself acting as a physician. His analysis of Vyasadeva's despondency, that you've allowed the people what they shouldn't take at all. Just like if someone is uh, has some uh, serious cough problem from smoking, and the doctor says, "Okay, stop smoking." Well, can I just take five a day, five cigarettes a day? The the doctor will tell, "No, no, I can't cure you if you don't stop. If you allow, oh, okay, all right." He wants to smoke. Okay, let's be nice to him. So, all right, don't smoke 25 a day, just smoke 5 a day. So that's the policy that Vyasadeva has had. Okay, just, you want sense gratification? Okay, in a limited way, you can do so. But now it says, no, that's, uh, you're never going to get cured if you indulge in that which is contrary to our real need. Also, Narada stated to Vyasa that Vyasa had indulged in dry philosophical speculations. Now you come to the Upanishads. Well, of course, they can be understood in a Vaishnav way also, but they're generally understood in a different way. So it's a very severe indictment and uh, Narad said overall that Vyas had improperly, Srila Prabhupada put it this way, he had improperly used his valuable time. Time should be used for Krishna. So, uh, some other points about the discontent of Vyas. Srila Prabhupada writes, perfection is never attained until one is satisfied at heart which has to be searched out beyond matter. So Vyasadeva, his very dissatisfaction in his heart indicated that he himself 
had not attained that for which he had given the Vedas. Because if the, the whole idea is that you should come to the ultimate level and you should be satisfied at heart. But he himself wasn't. Of course, we have to understand that this is some pastor. We ask we not to minimize the position of Vyas. But for whatever one does, if one is not satisfied at heart, then we can understand that whatever he's doing, it's not perfect. Ashantasya kutas sukam, Krishna rhetorically asks in the Bhagavad Gita, if one is not satisfied, then how can you be happy? Again, from various purports. The ultimate achievement cannot be attained by purification of the living being submerged in matter simply by the prescribed activities in the Vedas. So simply by following the activities in the Vedas, uh, you, you don't necessarily become purified. You don't necessarily get the ultimate benefit. People have faith in the Vedas. They should have faith in the Vedas. But apart from following all the rituals, they should come to the platform Atato Brahma Jignasa to inquire into the ultimate reality. Otherwise, simply by following all these Vedic principles, then that won't give satisfaction because satisfaction only comes by Real satisfaction for the soul only comes when one engages in unmotivated, uninterrupted devotional service to the transcendent Lord, which is the supreme dharma for all living beings. So it's not possible by any other activity, and that is the main point which is stressed at the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam. Just before we go on, we should understand this point. It's not just some other literature. This is the literature which is going to give us that which is not given elsewhere. Vedyam Vasava Matravastu. This is the actual meaning of the Vedas, which is not given in all the other literature, not clearly and directly. So that satisfaction, that's actually very good. If one becomes dissatisfied by following all the Vedic processes, because as Prabhupada writes, dissatisfaction is infused by the Lord so that the devotee endeavors for perfection. If one feels dissatisfied, well, I'm, I'm, being, I'm following dharma, I'm doing everything properly, uh, why am I dissatisfied? That is... That dissatisfaction is given by the Lord in the heart to spur us on to doing more, to going further, not just simply following rules, but you have to you have to go further, go further, further, further. What's we what is the perfect stage? Srila Prabhupada elsewhere, there are so many points in these fourth and fifth chapter. Srila Prabhupada writes, everything is tangible in the transcendental service of the Lord and without that is void. So this, this gives the idea of pratyakshakavamam dharmyam. One can practically experience in devotional service to the Lord the transcendental happiness. But without that, one can perform all rituals, yoga, uh, analyze the position of this material world, but the heart will be empty. One will not be satisfied. And I think we can all ourselves, at least those of us who are not in the Guru Kul, because those of us who chose ourselves to come to Krishna Consciousness, maybe the boys in the Guru Kul didn't choose. They were placed there by their parents. But we can experience how... We came to Krishna Consciousness, why? Because we felt some dissatisfaction. To be a pious Gujarati doesn't give full satisfaction to the heart. To have a big house and a big car, of course, not every Gujarati has a big house and a big car. Even to have a little house, 
and a motorcycle or whatever to be pious, go to the temple, say Jai Hind when you get up in the morning or whatever. It doesn't satisfy the heart. Prabhupada writes, one cannot be cheerful by nature unless one is factually situated in self-realization which is transcendental to the material body and mind. So this is all understood from Vyasa's despondency. You may say, well, why, why is Vyasa despondent? Just to show us, Vyasa, his despondency is just to demonstrate to us that even being as pious as Vyasa, even being as learned as we are, unless we come to the point of pure devotional service, it is shrama eva hi kevaram, work without any tangible result. Therefore, Srila Prabhupada writes, one has to approach a 100% perfect living being like Nara to solve the root cause of all despondencies. Yeah. By ourselves we can't work it out. The Asra is trying to work it out. So, I gave all the knowledge, which is meant for everyone's welfare, so they can become happy, but I'm not happy myself. And the whole thing's a failure. What am I, I I came to this world to give all this stuff. Now I gave it and everyone's supposed to be happy, but I'm not happy myself. Therefore Narad came. And Narad, Vyasadeva received him and he took knowledge from Narad. Which also goes to show that uh, all the avatars of the Lord, they show this, that they, they have to approach a guru to attain perfection. So I'll just go through this quickly because if it's gone through in detail, well, it may take... A very long time. Very, very long time. Srila Prabhupada writes, The philosophy which does not directly glorify the Supreme Lord cannot satisfy both the Lord and the living beings. So there may be, actually in the Vedic philosophy, there's so much philosophy. We'd be, we'd be surprised to see how much the philosophy and how much carefully worked out philosophy there is. Various Vedic schools branching off from the Vedas, the, the Buddhists and the Jains, and even the Charvakas, they work in, the, the atheistic Charvakas, they work in, uh, in opposition to the Vedas. So much philosophy is there. But if it doesn't directly glorify the Supreme Lord, he's not satisfied with it. And he's, if he's not satisfied with us, we also don't become satisfied. So we could become satisfied at some maybe intellectual level or we like to hear the stories of Mahabharata and the Puranas but uh, there may be some kind of satisfaction but unless we come to the platform of glorifying the Supreme Lord knowing who He is, why He is Supreme, why we should glorify Him and unless we do that and take pleasure in that then he won't be fully satisfied with us and we are then naturally we won't be fully satisfied either. If our Srila Prabhupada writes, if our engagement does not produce devotional service to the Lord, it is an improper usage of valuable time. We got this human form of life. It's tick, 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 tick. We're going towards death. We shouldn't waste time in matters which are not of the essence, which are not focused on Krishna and Krishna consciousness. Now, within the Vedas, Vyasadeva is very highly praised. Jnana and karma, speculative knowledge and fruitive work, but as Srila Prabhupada writes in this purport, speculative knowledge and fruitive work cannot lead one to the goal of perfection. So they may be very good compared to uh, 
gross mundane activities that have no relationship with anything to do with the Vedic path, but they cannot lead one to the goal of perfection. Simply by taking the knowledge of the Vedas and speculating and trying to understand it off. Uh, that's the Ghanis and then the Karmis, the Karma Karmis. They're not much concerned with philosophy. They just say, well, follow the Vedas, do what they tell you, and you'll get the result. Just like you don't know, you don't have to know how a car works to drive it. You get in the car and you go from A to B. You don't have to know how the, the, uh, I don't know if it still works like that, but it, they still have spark plugs and make a spark and that ignites the, and then there's some energy is produced and then it goes, and the car works. You don't have to know how it works. According to the karma khandis, you just do the Vedic rituals and you go to heaven. You don't have to know, you don't have any philosophy. Just enjoy yourself. And you come back again and you go back up again. That's enough philosophy, that's all you need. But, they cannot leave one to the goal of perfection. Indeed, Srila Prabhupada writes, a slight deviation from Bhagavad Purana may create havoc for self-realization. Because Bhagavad Purana gives the knowledge of self-realization clearly and abundantly. So if we deviate from that, again we get on the position of a miss is as good as a mile. <laughs> so don't deviate. Just take the knowledge given in the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the ultimate uh, contribution of Srila Vyasadeva. So, this knowledge is to be distributed. One should imbibe it and distribute it. It's, it may be a great shock for most people in the world, even in Gujarat. So many sets of Srimad Bhagavatam are being distributed in Navsari. Some. You have to call Acharya Prabhu. He's the Acharya of Bhagavatam set distribution. He can show you what to do. He's, uh, but if people read, people may be pious and think, oh yes, okay, I'll buy a set of, but it may be very shocking for them when they read it. With Prabhupada's purports, already Vyasadeva himself is being very strong, and then Srila Prabhupada stokes it up some more. A very heavy per just, oh, I'm worshipping demigods. And yeah, everyone else is worshipping demigods. My father, my grandfather, my gra both paternal side, maternal everyone's and here it says it's all nonsense. Maybe very difficult to accept. One has to be very humble and submissive. Uh but then, as Srila Prabhupada writes here, people in general are puzzled to fix their minds in the service of the Lord. They don't have an, an idea. We should fix our mind on Krishna only. Worshipping Krishna and people become confused. Oh, why? How are All the other swamis, they don't say that. They may become confused. Uh, because it seems to go against everything that they know. But the very fact that Vyasadeva, who himself gave the process for worshipping demigods, ultimately rejects it, should be for a sincere and intelligent person, uh, sufficient understanding, to come to the point which Vyasadeva delineates clearly in the Srimad Bhagavatam. That satisfaction of heart and perfection is only possible by exclusive service to Krishna. This is the message of Srimad Bhagavatam. Srila Prabhupada writes, In the material world everyone is engrossed with identifying the body or the mind with the self. We don't even know that unless we read this Bhagavatam, Prabhupada's purports, 
We won't even know that. Not only me, but everyone is engrossed with identifying the body or the mind with the self. Our lives are completely on the bodily platform. And as Srila Prabhupada writes, that is the root of all despondencies. The fact that we identify with the body and the mind is the cause of all our dissatisfaction. Simple point to understand. But we won't find it except in the Bhagavatam given by Srila Prabhupada. Uh, and that's the, especially in the modern civilization, everyone is very excited to get the latest car, latest cell phone, and this and that. But ultimately everyone is dissatisfied. Uh, or even if they're being very pious and going to the temple, still there's, they may feel complacent that I'm a very good Hindu. But it doesn't give satisfaction to the soul. It doesn't give us the ultimate goal of life. It does give us repeated birth and death. So if we do, if we do feel dissatisfied, that's a very good sign. Because if we feel satisfied in material life, that means we're a donkey. or comparable to a donkey who feels very satisfied although he's in he's a donkey why should he be satisfied being why should the living being who's meant to dance with krishna be satisfied as a donkey or why should he be satisfied being a big patel driving around in a big cup you can ask all your patel people why are you satisfied you're just like a donkey they'll become upset Maybe. So there are so many points we could we can understand from this that uh, Vyasadev he was feeling dissatisfaction he hadn't come to the proper point. Uh, Shila Prabhupada writes, commenting on this section in one lecture, we have to search out a Mahatma and surrender unto him, then our problems will be solved. Just like. Uh, Vyasadeva heard from Narada. And Srila Prabhupada right, uh, he said in his, when he was uh, speaking on this section, that is the duty of all devotees to give literature so that people may take benefit of it. Srila Prabhupada wrote extensively on this section of Bhagavatam. You may wonder, well, what's it got to do with my life? Something 5,000 years ago, Vyasa, I'm here in the modern world, it's completely different. It's not completely different. It's the same old birth, death, old age and disease, eating, sleeping, mating. It's the same thing. Just in the modern world, it's in a technological wrapping. Otherwise, it's the same old maya, same old nonsense. So, uh, we should give people this knowledge, as it is. Otherwise, they're wasting their life. Improper use of valuable time. But if they get the knowledge of Bhagavatam, as it is, their life can be uh, saved from the mediocrity, at best, of simply living in this world and thinking oneself happy without surrendering to Krishna. So we should clearly understand what is what are the teachings of Bhagavatam and the necessity of informing people of that. As described in this section, Srimad Bhagavatam is meant for all the living beings all over the universe for total liberation from all kinds of material bondage. And Srila Prabhupada writes in that vein. So his books are very powerful. Already Srimad Bhagavatam is very powerful. It is the literary incarnation of the personality of Godhead. And with Srila Prabhupada's explanation, the power flows through. The power means the power to chidyante vidyagantish, chidyante sarva to cut through all our illusions 
and give us the uh, knowledge that we require, the knowledge that Vyasadeva uh, ultimately gave, the knowledge of Srimad Bhagavatam, of our relationship with the all-perfect, all-pure personality of Godhead, Krishna. So, Hare Krishna. Any question about this, please? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. You can speak in Hindi? Galitam was Kamadla Sanskrit may or Hindi may Alake. Galat. Hindi may Galat Matlab. How do you say that in Sanskrit? Uh, Bhul Galitam Matlab Pakka. Hmm. In Sanskrit. So, Srimad Bhagavatam is the topmost Shastra. Mahabharat is composed for those who are Sri Shudra Dvijabandhunam Trayina Veda Gocharaha. Vyasadeva wrote the Mahabharat for, for uh, women, people of the Shudra caste, and the fallen descendants of Brahmanas who are not fit for the Vedas. So, there was, this was discussed recently after a class. There was a big discussion. So, sh should we or should we not read Mahabharata, have classes on Mahabharata? Um, Prabhupada himself recommends to read it. But in the Bhagavatam, it seems to be rejected. Not exactly rejected. We find it, it the first... Apart from describing the rishis at Naimisharanya and how they, dis, how they questioned Sutta Goswami, the first narration in the Bhagavatam is a continuation of Mahabharata. What happened with Yudhishthira, how he was lamenting, it's reiterating some topics of the Mahabharata, which to understand them fully, one would have to understand Mahabharata. Actually, the Bhagavatam, Kimba Parairi Sadhya Hridi Avarudhya Teja Kriti Visu Sushanus Takshana. One who's got a taste for Bhagavatam, then he won't take taste in any other literature. Um, Mahabharata is such that People like to hear because it's interesting stories. And many of them are in relationship to Krishna also. If not in relationship to Krishna, in relationship to Dharma. So Mahabharata, if it's explained through the philosophy of Srimad Bhagavatam, 
can be very good for uh, devotees who are not highly philosophical. Which is why I actually recommend it that there at Nandagram you could have regular classes on Mahabharata and Ramayana because you'll get a better attendance and devotees are less likely to fall asleep because it's very interesting. And these topics can be used for preaching also. So yeah, our real subject is Bhagavatam. But it's not that the other Shastras are rejected. If someone has the propensity to study in depth, not everyone has that. But they can study other Shastras also and explain that via Bhagavatam. The point should be to bring people to pure devotional service. All right, Hare Krishna, we'll finish there. It's quite a, a long class, it seems. Hare Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Srila Vyasadeva ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Hare Krishna.